All right. We're gonna do it the scan away. I'm gonna suck your brain dry. <laughs> Transmitting from the concrete canyons of New York City, yes, the Mars Magazine podcast is back. This is Adario Strange here with Vic Song. And this week we have a bit of a different episode. Just like last week, we're trying to switch it up, see what, you know, if different things work and, you know, what uh, what gets kind of interesting responses from you guys. So this week we actually kind of call back to what we did last week with uh, Star Trek. We actually had a chance to talk to... Uh, the author of a book that talks about Star Trek economics. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later, but first, uh, we're going to dive into a couple of news items. Vic, you had some stuff on deck that you want to... Yeah, so contact with aliens. Dario, when do you think that'll happen? I would almost say there's a better chance of us taking ourselves out as a human race, you know, by accident or war. Uh, than us lasting long enough for that to happen. I think we'll we'll sooner find just signs of life, uh, not necessarily intelligent, but just some signs of life. If if we're just talking about that, I would imagine that would be maybe fifty years. Nope. Well, let's let's put it this way: uh, a bunch of astronomers in Cornell they have come up with a figure, and when they say. We won't have contact with aliens for another 1,500 years. Where, where was it? So this was published on the Cornell website? Yeah. Cornell uh, released a press release that's talking about a study that they've done. Uh, it's one of their uh, like whiz kids, freshman, Evan Solomonides. And he's presenting a – actually, he just presented today to the American Astronomical Society in San Diego with uh, one of the more uh, – Yervent Terzian, who is the Distinguished University Professor of Astronomy, they've written a paper that combines the Fermi Paradox and the Mediocrity Principle, and uh, they did some number crunching, and they came up with the 1,500-year figure. So basically, if you don't know, the Fermi Paradox is saying something like, there's probably a billion Earth-like planets out there. So the fact that those planets exist, and we you would expect if there's a lot of Earth-like planets that there's intelligent life like us out there. So why haven't they gotten in contact with us? And that's the Fermi Paradox. And they kind of added that to the theory of um, the mediocrity principle, which means like this one I found a little complicated to understand. But the mediocrity principle is that this solar system is probably not that unique, which means that there's a lot of things out there. And uh, somehow by smooshing those uh, numbers together, they came up with this 15, 1500 year uh, figure. And in in the paper, did they say these are intelligent aliens or just alien life? Like, did they distinguish like, you know, one from the other? I think they mean intelligent alien life, like like you or I, but from a different Earth-like planet billions of miles away. And they, they were they were very, very, very uh, careful to point out that, you know, we could hear something before then. There's nothing stopping them from, there's nothing stopping us from hearing from aliens within the, the next 1500 years. Like, we could maybe hear from them next year or something. They're saying that's definitely possible, but that given what they know about math and the how far we've currently broadcast radio signals, we're probably not going to hear from them for another 1500 years if, and that's only if we manage to last that long and not blow ourselves up between now and then. I have two reactions to that uh, report. So one, if I just take the report at face value, it's actually a little scary because when you think of these kind of predictions, if you go back even 50 years, 50 to 100 years in our own history here on the planet, a lot of predictions often are maybe a little too conservative. And I'm not talking about flying cars. I'm just talking about just general advances in science. And you'll notice that often, like, we kind of short sell some of, you know, we we can't uh, predict, like, some of the advances that are coming up. So that scares me because if they're saying 1,500 years, if I just believe what they're saying, then that makes me think, okay, well, then definitely 500 years. We're mm-hmm. definitely, something's definitely going to happen. Um, the key, of course, as you mentioned, uh, being, you know, do we even, you know, last that long? But so that's one way I look at it. But the other way I look at it is, I guess, it's kind of linked to the first reaction, which is, you know, you can crunch all the numbers you want, but there's just no way to predict, you know, a lot of the things that are going to come down our way, you know, with regard to 
how we travel through the stars, what kind of communication devices we can, you know, use to, com- you know, connect to other solar systems. Uh, you know, there's just, there are too many variables in play. And right. I think just numbers, like when, when they, when they crunch numbers and they talk about the number of stars in the universe, even that kind of thing, it's like, well, you don't, do we really know the nature of the universe at this point? I mean, there are people who are still wondering, very smart people who are still wondering, are we simply a cell within a, in, within the body of a, of a larger being? And is that being in the body of a larger being in another universe that they think is a universe, but is actually just a body? I mean, you know, like there's yeah. so much we don't know. It's an interesting study, but I think, like I said, I think it's hard for me to believe that if we do continue, you know, at our current pace, you know, exploring space, that we won't find microbes, you know, some, at least some hint of, you know, non earth origin life of some sort, even, you know, just microscopic, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure we found like bacteria, like dead bacteria in some of the ice in Mars. Haven't we? Am I remembering that wrong? Uh, If you have something to, I see, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make that claim. See, that sounds familiar to me, but I wouldn't make that claim unless I actually had the information in front of me. So that's true. I seem to remember something like that, hearing something like that, but I could be wrong. If that was definitely true, I feel like there would be a headline on the newspaper saying, you know, confirmed, you know, Martians exist. We don't know, you know, so I do remember, I, I, I vaguely remember kind of something along the lines of what you're saying, but I, I feel like there was some fuzziness around what they had actually found. Yeah. Otherwise we could say there are Martians. They just can't see them. They're microscopic. So well, what's your guess? My guess? I, I kind of agree with you that there are a lot of variables and I don't know, like, cause this paper hasn't been super published yet. I, I couldn't find it at least. Uh, so we don't really know what calculations they used in it. Are they accounting for us being a static society? And that's how they're calculating for the 1500 year thing. I don't know, but there, I've also think that there's a slight possibility that maybe aliens have already visited us. We just don't know it yet. And if that's the case, then that whole entire thing is moot. And there's also the possibility that we are aliens. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, just if- because we have a very old history on this planet, doesn't mean we're not actually from someplace else. That's very Battlestar Galactica of you. Very, oh, yeah. Very, <laughs> can you just give like the listeners a quick synopsis of what you're talking about? I love that. Uh, okay. So um, Battlestar Galactica was this really great TV show on the <laughs> sci-fi channel. No, no, no. I mean, I'm assuming, I'm assuming people know that much. I'm just talking about that well, plot you know. twist. Well, you know, at the end, after we've spent, like, what was it, six seasons with, with the Battlestar Galactica and them trying to survive everything, they finally reach a planet that they can just live after humanity's been wiped out. And the twist at the end is when they get there, it's our planet, and they're looking at all of these primates, or, like, prim- primitive humans and the, these cavemen hunting around in loincloths. And they're like, oh, yeah, this could work. We just have to destroy all of our super space technology around here. So, like, the the twist was the show that we thought was in the future is actually billions of years in the past. It was brilliant because it was a great end, but it was also a possible, like, if you want to keep milking the series or milking the, the, the franchise, it would have been a great kind of, like, kickoff to something else, you know? Yeah, and it would also mean that we're all part Cylon. There you go. <laughs> I know some people in real life right now who are definitely part Cylon, so that would not surprise me. Uh, so moving on, we, you had another piece of news. This is, um, less on the science side, science and space side, and more on the cinematic side. Yeah. So there is a cool series on Netflix coming out, a Netflix original series. And we know how well all of those are going so far. It's out July. That's not ironic. You're being, you're being very serious when you say that. I'm being extremely sincerely, you know, sincere, sincerely sincere. Um, so the, the latest in the bunch of Netflix original series is called Stranger Things and it's out July 15th. There's eight episodes. And basically the premise of this is kind of like those eighties thrillers that you used to watch, like the cult classics, uh, kind of think maybe E.T. meets Stephen King type feel. And it's a show that's set in some small town in Indiana during the eighties. And a young boy vanishes into thin air, and his mother, who's going to be played by Winona Ryder, attempts to find him. And it looks like from the trailer, which, you know, you should check out, it's super cool. It's got a really cool um, 
gritty feel to it. Uh, and it seems like there's some supernatural things involved, possibly top secret government experiments, a weird girl who knows things. And so this isn't like um, like an episodic uh, uh, Twilight Zone kind of thing. This is more like a one. This is set like a one story set in yeah. one world kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. And it seems like there's weird stuff happening in this town in Indiana. And actually, what makes me kind of excited is that the creative team uh, is made up of Matt and Ross Duffer, and they've worked on episodes of Wayward Pines. So we might get something really cool along those fields from this. And, you know, this is uh, reminds me of another, uh, like a similar show coming out on Hulu. Well, that was just announced that they're developing on Hulu uh, a competing Mm -hmm. uh, internet video streaming service that you may have heard of. And the show is called Dimension 404. And I believe Dimension 404 is described more along the lines of like a Twilight Zone kind of, you know, weird story of the week kind of thing. But uh, yeah, it, it feels like there's this kind of trend. That, do you remember when Lost came out, right? I like, remember uh, Lost, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I feel like when that came out back then, I guess, or is it maybe 10 years ago? Mm-hmm. Like, how old is that? So like maybe 10 years ago. I feel like when that came out, it was kind of like an outlier. Now, I feel like we're in a, you know, there's just this trend of like, okay, you've got Cloverfield. You've got all these different, like, movies and TV shows coming out that definitely owe their uh, aesthetic and conceptual DNA to the Twilight Zone and Rod Searling. And it's it's kind of interesting that a lot of them are also kind of throwback attempts. Like a lot of them not only take that Twilight Zone approach, but they also kind of try to, if they're not going back to the 80s, they definitely kind of do this uh, Spielbergian, mm-hmm. Stephen King mashup kind of thing. I mean, is that, are you noticing this trend? Is this just me? No, I think I'm noticing what you're saying too. I think one of the, at least what my take on it is, is that if you throw it back to an earlier time pre-internet, you have a little more leeway with the story and like character interactions. And also you don't have to deal with technology being in the story or a driving part of the story. So in a weird way, you're kind of allowing a little more mystery to, to exist. Like if you have a, the government is doing something creepy story. Like if you throw it back and you put it somewhere in the eighties, you can, you can kind of mask the, the, the bad dudes a little bit better than if you had the internet or at least that's my take on it. And so moving on from TV, we're going to, well, I had the opportunity to talk to Manu Sadia. He is the author of Treconomics, the economics of Star Trek. Uh, if you were listening last week, we had a show devoted entirely to the 50th anniversary of Star Trek. And so this year, there's a bunch of content, you know, books, uh, TV shows, you know, live experiences. There's a new Star Trek film, Star Trek Beyond coming out. Uh, a bunch of Star Trek stuff uh, coming our way, you know, commemorating the 50th anniversary. And along those lines, this book, uh, Treconomics by Manu Sadia, talks about what it might be like if we applied some of the concepts in the Star Trek universe to reality. A lot has changed in the past 300 years. People are no longer obsessed with the accumulation of things. We have eliminated hunger, want, the need for possessions. We've grown out of our infancy. This is the 24th century. Material needs no longer exist. Then what's the challenge? The challenge, Mr. Offenhaus, is to improve yourself, to enrich yourself. Enjoy it. This is the Morris Podcast, and we have a special guest, Manu Sadia, the author of Treconomics, the economics of Star Trek. And this is the perfect guest to bring on because last week we spoke about the 50th anniversary of Star Trek. So... Yeah, I had the pleasure of meeting Manu in New York at uh, a book launch party for the book, and I managed to snag him and get him for a, f- a few minutes to talk about the book. How you doing, Manu? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. So can you just like, uh, before we get into the book, can you just give us like a quick, like a mini synopsis of like what your background is and, you know, in terms of like, you know, study? So I did study economic history. Um and I'm, uh, you know, from France originally. So that's the two things. But then, you know, I live in the U.S. I've been in the U.S. for 20 years. And, uh, 
an avid uh, Star Trek fan uh, throughout my life. So that's uh, usually, you know, when people ask me, so what do you do? Where are you from? I usually say I'm a Star Trek fan. It's that bad. <laughs> right, right, right. No, I mean, so I mean, like, academically, is there like some, are you, do you have any yeah. kind of economics background or kind of like sociology background? Economic history and uh, uh, history in general. And, you know, I, I, I went to the University of Chicago and Sorbonne and all that. So I'm a, I studied too long and too much. Um. <laughs> so, and so you, I, I read in the book that you started watching Star Trek as a child. Yes. And so you, I mean, one thing that we talked about uh, regarding Star Trek last week is this, you know, what is unique about it is that it really, it's science fiction, but it really does kind of show us a kind of utopian world that might be possible in the not too distant future. So now when you were a child, were you did this already did this did this idea of that this could really be a real future did that start to get you know that really, that's really what got to me actually um that's really what got to me and I, I was eight or nine so you know it was I, it was not fully formed as a uh you know I did not fully grasp all of it and also to be noted uh, I grew up in France um and I got into Star Trek through the movies because the TV show was not shown on TV. And even if it had been shown on TV, we did not have TV at home because my parents were against it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I get into Star Trek through the movie, the the motion picture, and then I started reading Asimov. And you know, because Asimov was the scientific advisor on the motion picture, and and there are a lot of uh, similar things between Star Trek and. Asimov. And so that's how I got into science fiction. Now, which Star Trek did you, what was your first, uh, do you remember which Star Trek you first saw? Oh, yeah. It was the motion picture when it came out in France. Was it the Shatner or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, William Shatner, it's, it's, okay. The, yeah, in the, you know, so it's the first movie they made and it was greenlit in the wake of Star Wars. And it's a very strange movie because there's not much happening in there and there's no real villain and it's this sort of contemplation of, you know, I don't know what. It's it's very supposedly philosophical. It's mostly great special effects, but there's not much going on. Um, and by the way, it, it bombed. And so that after that, Roddenberry was never allowed again to touch any of the movies. Um, right, that's by the movie Roddenberry, division. the creator of Star Trek. And so, yes, sorry. <laughs> and so... Um, the motion picture is actually a very interesting movie to watch because it, it, it's more like Tarkovsky or, you know, it's more one of these uh, Russian uh, science fiction movie where it's very slow and it takes its time to to um, show the starships and the space and all that. It's it's a very – so that's how I, 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 I was blown away. I was eight. I was like, what the hell is this? This is fantastic. Um and you know there was no real villain. There was no space battle. I was, my parents were really anti-war people, so I was not allowed to go see Star Wars until you know much later. <laughs> so, now, so let's go ahead and just dive right in to yeah. the book. One thing that we kind of got stumped on last week was the the specifics of the Star Trek economy, at least on Earth. So I'm just curious, yes. like, can do you have? Were you able to figure out like what? I mean, because it, it seemed like everyone basically like if you didn't want to work, you didn't have to work. And it seemed yeah. like it might be one of the society, you know, so, social constructs where everyone's given a basic income. I mean, I, like, did you get a sense of? I, I, yeah. I, I, so it seems to me that um, they have the replicators and the replicators have made a lot of things obsolete, uh, things like markets, because. If you have replicators, you can get anything you want at any time, anywhere. So there's no real imbalance between supply and demand. Like there's too much of something over there and not enough here. And so, and therefore, you know, there is trade happening. So, I mean, I have this example in the book where um, there's, you know, if you can get your tea all gray hot at any time, anywhere, you know, in your house or wherever you are, then there's no real need for a guy to actually manufacture tea bags. And, you know, hold the supply of tea and, and chamomile to make all gray. So, yes, they have those machines that basically render obsolete a lot of the economic behaviors and 
um, economic tools that we use today. I'm not even sure there's income because um, what's the point? You know, uh, everybody's provided. The thing that's interesting, though, uh, about that is so you do have replicators and they're free to use as what is called public goods. So anybody can use it and nobody puts a uh, toll or tariff on the usage of those machines, those replicators. Other races in the galaxy or races, other civilizations in the galaxy do have replicators as well, like the Frankie, but they make you pay for them. So what that, what that means is the Federation has made a political decision to make the replicators free and available. That's, that's, that's the key there. It's not the technology. It's the fact that there was some kind of, at some point, some social compact or uh, a political decision and policy decision made collectively to make the necessities of life available to all. Right. And that, that's something we actually talked about last week was this notion of the Ferengi, even though there seems to be no real uh, class disparity on Earth in the Federation, that the Ferengi you know, still operate in this kind of, you know, uh, acquisition <laughs> phase. That's and, and, fantastic. Right? Yeah, and, and they always mention latinum, like gold-pressed yeah. latinum. <laughs> and so, so the idea of the gold-pressed latinum is it's not replicable. Ah. So the latinum itself is a is it some kind of a um, – it's actually a liquid metal because there's one episode where – some dude hides his latinum in his uh, second stomach. So it's liquid metal that is pressed in worthless gold. Like that's that's how uh, Quark calls the 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 gold, and it's not replicable. Okay, that's why I didn't know that. Okay, so that's that's. Well, I mean, it's, it's kind I of this no little. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, you have to watch Deep Space Nine very uh, uh, deep to to get to that point and to that illusion. So yes, yeah, so the latinum is not re- replicable, and as as a result, it is a um, it cannot be con- counterfeited, and um, it, it's it's used as a medium of exchange in the galaxy. Um, I believe the Federation does have accounts in Latinum. Like you can see that uh, the officers on Deep Space Nine, like they interact with the Ferengis, they play games, and they even have a tab at the bar because you know when you have to deal with foreigners and people outside of the Federation who still use money and currency, um, then you know it's available for you. But uh, the Federation is so wealthy that it doesn't matter if their officers, you know, blow a bunch of money at the bar or at the casino. Yeah, and that's why I thought Deep Space Nine. I, look, I have to ma- uh, admit, Deep Space Nine was not one of my favorite among the series, really? but it was incredibly helpful because it took us out of this kind of bubble of the Federation and showed us, like, okay, this is what really happens when all of these different uh, species, you know, come together. Deep you know. Space Nine is fascinating because it's where you see a utopian society like the Federation actually facing the rest of the world, right? Um, and in a way, you know, it's it's almost like a a roadmap for us. I mean, the the way I envisioned it was, you know, at some point, some countries on Earth here in the real in real life, you know, will reach that point where abundance is equally or somewhat equally distributed, but the other countries won't, and so we will have a situation that's very similar, where some uh, uh, pockets of people on earth live a very satisfying life where where the rest of the world doesn't it's kind of reminiscent to what's going on today by the way but well, so I, I want, that that brings me to one of your chapter titles i'll read it and maybe you can kind of like just give us a synopsis of what this means it's chapter five uh the thought that warp engines might be causing uh, some uh, kind of damage which is i know a call back to an episode and then um the subtitle of that chapter is free riding and the negative externalities in a post scarcity world so what does that mean so that's the big question i mean this is kind of cool that star trek uh and specifically the next generation actually try to tackle the big question of our day which is negative externalities and negative externality is a cost imposed on a third party by uh, the economic activity or transaction of two parties. So, for instance, uh, a big negative externality is carbon pollution. So, um, if you live, and the question is this, if you live in a society like Star Trek's that is infinitely wealthy, 
um, what happens to some of the activities that normally um, pollute or uh, cause um, costs on other people who are not part of your society. And so this is there is this one episode in The Next Generation, I think it's in the seventh season, and the chapter is about that. Um, it's called Force of Nature, and it's when um, the Enterprise and Picard and all his crew realize that uh, going at high warp speed tears up the fabric of space-time right. slowly. And actually, is destroying the planet of you know one of the uh, one planet that's inhabited. Um, but longer term, it's going to have terrible consequences. And so they decide to um, voluntarily uh, reduce their their uh, warp speed, you know, to warp five, and they try to negotiate with the others and all that. So that's um, so that's something that you know you would you would think. I mean, these are questions that are very serious and complicated, and the chapter involves, you know, um, some game theory and things like that. Um, you would think Star Trek would never engage in these things, um, or a TV series in general, but they actually do. And um, that's what I really like about the whole thing. And Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, all that, it's, they actually took on, like, very serious and challenging questions. And um, gave a very good, I think, a good summary of the problem. Uh, that Force and Nature episode, the writers didn't like it. Uh, they're like, ah, yeah, it's messy and all that. But it's, I don't know of many other TV shows, I don't know any actually, that um, try to raise the question of free writing. Um, so free writing basically being uh, some people take advantage of common goods and, um, you know, such as the atmosphere. Uh, and because they're free and available. And so how do you rein in these behaviors? How do you prevent polluters from polluting? Uh, how do you make them stop polluting voluntarily? These are big questions, and these are policy questions, and Star Trek actually tries to take on these big questions. We don't see that very often these days. I'm, I'm very hopeful that the new series will do that, but we we don't see that kind of serious... Uh, Maybe the wire, but it's certainly not utopian. Um, that's interesting. You just brought up the new series coming uh, to CBS. Did you? Uh, I mean, were you able to pierce the veil and and find out any information about the new series? Like, just in your role as like doing the book or anything like that? I'm not allowed to say. <laughs> oh, oh, so you did? Okay, so you're not allowed, I'm not to, allowed say to say. No, no, I'm not allowed to say anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. I wish you had not asked that question. But, oh man. Uh, okay. Hey, hey. No worries. That that's enough. I, I'm, I'm just based on who is involved with the new series. Mm -hmm. So Nicholas Mayer, who um, is the guy who wrote The Wrath of Khan, directed uh, and wrote, uh, you know, all the greatest Star Trek movies, The Wrath of Khan, uh, The Voyage Home, and The Undiscovered Country. So he's on. He's he's, bright. he's like one of the greatest movie writers. He he's also the guy who wrote and directed The Day After you know, I mean, Nicholas Mayer is is an amazing filmmaker and is an amazing storyteller. Storyteller, and you know, he's he's fantastic. Then there's Brian Fuller, who is um, who used to work on Voyager and you know has had a string of amazing shows since then. And as a showrunner and um, a writer, he's he's extremely well respected. People really adore his work, and he's fantastic. And then they just recruited Joe Minoski, uh, who used to work on Next Generation and Voyager and produce and all that. So it's a bunch of uh, Star Trek TV veterans who are in charge of it. Um, and these people can really tell good stories. And they have, they're scholars of the show and they're scholars of the universe. And, and they really respect it and they really um, try to maintain its integrity and its message. And they really believe in it. And so I wanted to get into another chapter where you talk about the psychology of utopia. Uh, last week when we were talking about the universe, the Star Trek universe, um, we got into kind of like, you know, how you would operate in such a world. And I'm just curious, like, what what's your take on the psychology of utopia or technological I see, utopia? I mean, think about it this way, man. Um, you grew up in a world, if you're a Star Trek character, you know, you grew up in a world where nobody has ever experienced financial hardship or stress or you know hunger or whatever so you've ne you you will never experience distress financial or otherwise and 
neither your neighbors or your friends will ever experience distress uh, and the kind of distress that we do experience today. We know for a fact that poverty and hunger have terrible effect on the brain, on brain development, on on even, you know, the way people uh, uh, react and make decisions. Um, so none of that. And, and neither you, it's like you live in a world where um, neither you nor your friends nor your family nor nor people around you experience financial hardship or hunger or the stress of poverty. And so, and so psychologically, what kind of effect? Do you, I mean, so like what? Found effects. Found effects. Um, and it's almost like these people are aliens. And they are, by the way. That's, that's why we can't relate to them. That's why they're so weird, right? And they're so, um, they don't have any sort of, uh, um, any of the psychopathologies, pathologies that, that, and the psychopathologies that come with living in a world that's unequal and, and, um, and harshly unequal. None of these psychopathologies exist. They're, they're very mental, they're, they're mentally very stable. And, as a result, they're also much more interested in justice and in ethical pursuits than in anything else. Because if you have a, you know, if you will never experience any kind of um, d- economic distress or economic stress, what else is left? Well, um, it's the, now you can actually tackle the big questions. You know, like what is my place in the world? Right. What am I going to do with my life? It, it, it becomes a, the question of why am I here for becomes a practical question. Right. Instead of some kind of, you know, phys- philosophical reverie and, you know, and then you have the grind of everyday work and trying to make a living and survive. Uh, you no longer have to work to survive. So now, you know, you have to face the big existential questions. And in Star Trek, they resolve that by um, having these people, you know, explore the galaxy for the sake of science. Um May some other people will just you know make pottery at home or uh, become very good chefs or uh, make art or be very good parents or teachers uh, and devote their lives to the community. I mean that's why. What am I here for? Um, and it's interesting it's, because that that seems to argue against this notion that some people have, whereby if we all had let's say a basic income and we, you know, had no necessarily, you know, we didn't have to need for anything that somehow, you know, a large portion of society would just fall into sloth and crime. Yeah. I do not even the idle argument at all. Uh, Humans are restless and um, yeah. So, so the moment, and by the way, Star Trek doesn't either. I mean, the moment they're all super busy in there. And I don't see, you know, the moment we do have some kind of, uh, you know, I, I don't know how it's going to be structured. Uh, and I'm not, you know, this is economic policy and it has to be debated. But regardless, I don't believe that the moment there is some form of basic income in society, I do not believe that people will be idle at all. Uh, actually, it will free them to do more stuff. Um, I, I have no doubt of that. And by the way, you know, even in a world where there is no basic income, there are already 20 or 30 percent of people who are idle anyways. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I mean, it's like it's not like things it's not like this is going to change, you know, and some are idle by choice and some are idle by uh, uh, necessity. But the, the truth is, um, uh, if we all get to live like, you know, Japanese retirees, right? Well, Japanese retirees, like they're actually super active. They, yes. they help. I mean, they do. Uh, I, I was thinking of that comparison. I think it makes sense. Like they, they, they help their families. They, they help the community. They, they travel. They do art. They, you know, I mean, it's not. Yeah, this yeah, that's is a perfect contra- example. Yeah, I actually lived in Japan, so that's a perfect example. I know of what you speak. I'm fascinated by Japan because this is a society that has this sort of a. I mean, it has its problem, but it it is very rational. And uh, civil in a way that that's very reminiscent of Star Trek. I'm sure there's a mean streak somewhere in there, but uh, <laughs> there always there's a, there's always one. But for for the matter at hand, it's it, there is something there that I don't think people will be idle. I, I this this is a weak argument against better distribution of wealth. Two like final questions. One is a uh, serious. One's a bit fun. 
So on the serious side, you know, we really are a lot of us, a lot of Trekkies, a lot of Star Trek fans are fascinated by this idea of, you know, one world government, uh, you know, a situation that you kind of, you know, talk about in your book uh, with regard to, you know, an income less or, 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 you know, no income being necessary. So the question is, how realistic do you think this is, you know, for us in real life? Like, do you think this is you know, possible in our lifetime, 200 years from now in the 23rd century? Like, like how realistic is this? Well, um, the part where we travel to the stars, I, I don't buy it. But the, the rest is surprisingly uh, not crazy. If you let economic growth happen, you know, over the next 300 years, just by compounding, uh, we'll be at a level of social wealth that's, you know, unfathomable almost. The same way, think about like how we live today and, and imagine we, we were traveling back to 1800. The level of wealth, living standard, you know, technological progress between 1800 and now is, is just crazy. And that's 200 years. So imagine that leap from now to, you know, 200 years in the future in terms of, yeah, standard of living, um, social wealth, society's wealth. And I mean, so the question really to me is not that because that is actually, you know, if you, if you let economic growth happen and science and, and research, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll get to something that's, you know, science fiction in a way. Right. Uh, but the real question is political is, okay, so society will become extremely wealthy and how do we um, how do we decide on the distribution of wealth in society? And that's a decision, man. That's not something that will happen with machines. The machines themselves cannot distribute wealth equally. It's not the machine. It's us. So it's on us. Star Trek can happen if we make it happen. And it's not about the technology. It's about the politics. Just saying. Just saying. But, you know, there, there are some words and uh, some concepts that you'd better not say uh, in America. Um, but I'm not American, so I can see them, uh, <laughs> you know, like I, in the sense that it's, it's, they're, they're considered bad words, um, you know, the S word and oh, so you're talking about socialism. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, um, and socialism in a way is a response to, uh, a question of, you know, scarcity. Uh, the socialism is a response to scarcity, economic scarcity. Um, in a world of plenty and abundance, you cannot call it socialism because you do not have to distribute resources that are scarce. So Star Trek is beyond that. It's 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 not. It it tries to show a world where these questions are no longer the central question in society, but in practice and in the real world, I'm not sure that socialism. You know, and and the thing is, that I don't like the word said here because. It closes off the debate, and a lot of people are just like end up not being receptive to any of what you're saying right, when you right. say that word. Well, but, you know, I mean, Bernie is is pretty popular right now, so yes. Um, is he popular among Star Trek fans? I, I don't know about Star Trek fans, but I do know that like yeah, here in the U.S., he's he's getting some traction. Well, I mean, this brings me one question that I kind of forgot to ask earlier: Is there any speaking of you know socialism, capitalism? Is there, did you find any like comprehensive list of the Ferengi rules of acquisition? Well, this is just I, a geek I want, question. Uh, so, um, Ira Stephen Bear, the showrunner, published a book with uh, like those that have uh, that were on the show. There are several online. I mean, you know, Memory Alpha has them. The full 283 uh, rules were never fully quoted on the show. Uh, so <laughs> the the I think there, there's like about 120 that were quoted on the show of the 283. So um, my favorite being um, never be afraid to mislabel a product. <laughs> 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 so you know it's like star trek it's 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 it says something about star trek star trek pretends to be science fiction but it's not uh it's uh, yeah it's it's i, I love the Ferengis, man yeah. so yeah uh, but there is a book called the 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 rules of acquisition as told to ira Stephen bear by quark um you can find it on amazon probably at one cent so that's you know it's it, it was published in the course of the show it's fantastic i mean how can you not like 
Deep Space Nine. This is a, this is a show where Iggy Pop was featured as a guest star. So, are you familiar with the original uh, series from the '60s, or are you just mainly Next Generation? Well, the book it was more focused on Next Generation and up, but. I am a total fan of the original series, man. I'm, I'm like... Okay, and so like, across all the series, whether we're talking old school, new school, do you have a favorite episode and why? Favorite episode? Oh, my God, this is so I know that's so hard. hard. Yeah, I know that's hard. Oh that's a hard God, question. so hard. Um, well, if you're trying to convince someone to watch Star Trek, what episode would you use as like the entry gateway drug? Who watches The Watcher? Season three, The Watchers. Season three of Next Generation. It's a... It's a uh, it's an episode that really harkens back to the original series in terms of its uh, thema- thematic and so so it's uh, a breach of the prime directive in a society that is not uh, that you know doesn't have space travel or science or something like that and it's 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 very cleanly written and uh, it has all these amazing moments and it's really hopeful and re- it really speaks well of what Star Trek is about. Um, and and, and as, aside from the episodes and, and the, the TV shows and the movies, getting back to your book, just to wrap up, what's the, how can we draw someone in who maybe is not a full Trekkie and maybe not fully conversant in the series and the movies, but they'll be able to get something out of the book. How would you pull them in? Like, what would you tell them like a nugget? I would tell them that um, if you're interested in, you know, economics, if you have a passing interest in economics, then, you know, the book is about, in fact, economics. It's a little bit, it's trying to, the book tries to do just like Star Trek does, um, talk about uh, serious things in an entertaining fashion. So I'm, I'm just using Star Trek as a springboard to discuss, you know, other questions. And it's, uh, uh, yes, so the book also talks about the future. And um, we all have an interest in the future. Awesome, awesome. Okay, and, and again, the name of the book is Trekonomics, The Economics of Star Trek, and that's by Manu Sadia. And the publisher is Piper Text, and is, that's available everywhere in stores, Amazon, online? Everywhere. Everywhere, hopefully. <laughs> is there any, is, like, do you have an online presence or any kind of, like, social media presence you want to give out? I, I fool around on Twitter, uh, at Trekonomics, so that's easy. Um and yeah, I mean, you know, there's a Facebook page for the book and there, there's a bunch of web pages at the publishers and all that stuff. So um, if you type in Treconomics or if you type in the economics of Star Trek, you will find me uh, and you will find the book, not me, but the book. Awesome. Well, Manu, I really appreciate you taking the time and I- I'm going to. This is so awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm going to take a deep dive into this book because I feel, I mean, just like skimming, like the little bit I've been able to read, I've already learned a bit. So I really appreciate you putting the book together and taking the time to speak to us. The 10th rule of acquisition is greed is eternal. A deal is a deal. Rule of acquisition number 16. Rule of acquisition 17. A contract is a contract is a contract, but only between Ferengi. I met him earlier at a book event in Manhattan. Yeah, and he was very cool in person, and we talked a little bit. Actually, I have to mention on a side note, I also met one of my uh, sci-fi, current sci-fi heroes, uh, Hugh Howey, the author of Dust. Um, And we had a great time talking science fiction, publishing, and our uh, mutual hatred for the Cavaliers versus uh, the beloved uh, Golden State Warriors. So that was that was pretty sports. interesting. Yeah, sports talk from two sci-fi guys. Um, I, I think I'm going to, like, maybe in a future episode, talk a little bit more about Hugh Howey and what he's doing and why I'm so interested in what he's doing. But, yeah, I met him at um, the Treconomics party, and it was just great to speak to Manu Sadia because, you know, the universe of Star Trek really does – deliver fascinating concepts. And I think many of them are worth exploring in depth. And that's what Manu does in his book. Uh, Next, we want to talk about another universe uh, that we've (laughs) referenced in the past, Star Wars, the Star Wars universe. So Lucasfilm today uh, announced, released a video in conjunction with uh, the company Magic Leap. 
Magic Leap is a company known for what they call mixed reality. Some people like to think of it as a mix of augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, and they did a joint announcement today uh, announcing that they would be collaborating on mixed reality content. And to kick that off, they actually released a video that showed C-3PO uh, and R2-D2 from Star Wars holographic uh, representations of the two droids entering a real life room uh, at life size scale and in proper relation to, you know, spatial relation to the rest of the room. Mm -hmm. And so they enter the room and they're chatting, you know, doing their usual back and forth banter with each other. They enter and then they, you know, go to the desk, a, a real world desk and the, and R2D2 looks down at the desk and then a map uh, a topographic map emerges from the desk. And, you know, the interesting thing about this video is that throughout the video, there's a message at the bottom in little text that says this is, you know, basically saying this is what uh, Magic Leap, Leap technology really looks like. This is not, you know, special effects. We didn't tweak anything to enhance it to make it look better. This is what it really looks like. And so and so the deal that they announced, uh, Lucasfilm and Magic Leap is... I think it's called the Collab Lab, and it's going to be based in San Francisco on Lucasfilm's campus in San Francisco. And they haven't announced a date for anything. They haven't announced any particular content titles or if it's going to be a movie or a TV show or just some sort of specialized experience. But, um, th I mean, this was exciting, fascinating, and just, I mean, you all know Star Wars and you most likely know Lucasfilm. If you don't know Magic Leap, Magic Leap emerged, I guess, about, ooh, I want to say two, three years ago. Uh, it's as only this, been that long? It's only been that long. Well, I think it's, I mean, if memory serves, I, it, they have not been in, like, the major media that long. I think maybe the earliest, maybe 2013, 2014, something like that. Hmm. And they, uh, Again, like the best way to describe what they do is kind of augmented reality, which means kind of seeing imagery in front of you that you can interact with in the real world. And then a mix of virtual reality because, you know, the items that they the, the objects that they put in the real world are like holographic. You can look around them and they have like form and they basically form a, a new reality around you. And so they're calling this mixed reality. Did you see the video? I did see the video. I I saw the video. Others saw the video, and then the internet broke, basically. Oh, so what what was your reaction? Oh, I thought it was super cool. I was I was you know one detail that I really liked is that when R two goes behind the table, you can kind of see part of his lower half of the like part of the lower half of his body is obscured by that table. I just thought that was like a really really kind of like oh man, that is a nice detailed touch. That, that tiny kind of, detail, yeah. It's super, and uh, I don't know. I was. It's like having C three PO and R two in your living room, and just that idea. I didn't know I needed it until now. Basically, right. watching it, I just, I just needed. And so, as I described, I think in a previous episode, I actually had an opportunity to meet with Magic Leap uh, about a year ago, and they did not show me the Magic Leap device, but I pestered them. And I like tried every way possible through my lawyerly techniques, uh, interrogating them, trying to get them to kind of give me a sense of what the device looked like and looks like. And from what I can glean, it's definitely something that you wear. Mm -hmm. Um, and it appears that, uh, the imagery, uh, is projected onto your eyes. And that's about it. That's, that's so crazy. Like, so it's, it's not like, Google Glass, where it's a glass and you just see, th like, I guess the way Google Glass works, you kind of just see the image through the glass, right? Yeah, the image is actually projected onto a tiny glass panel mm -hmm. in front of one of your eyes. And I've actually, I, have you used Google Glass? Because I have, I'm wondering, have you? I've not, but I've seen many a glass hole. Yeah, so I come easy, easy. <laughs> Some of those glass holes are my friends. No, but I've used glass actually. So I used a friend's Google Glass about I don't know two years ago when I was thinking of buying one myself, and they were fifteen hundred bucks. So that's a very you know you have to research yeah. that purchase. And I had this thing on for about thirty minutes, and I thought fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, I mean it really. It, it, no, no way. 
Not, I mean, <laughs> like, there was nothing going on with that device that was impressive enough to get me to part with even $500, to be honest. Um, so I didn't buy that, but I am experienced with Google Glass. Um, and no, the way they describe Magic Leap is that, no, it's not uh, some panel in front of your eyes. It's actually, at least the way it was explained to me, unless I misunderstood something, it's pro- it's something it's projected onto your eyes allowing you to kind of look, you don't have to kind of worry about where you look around, how you look around. And that kind of uh, helps it have this kind of a spatial position uh, orientation, you know, with regard to wherever you're standing. Um, The other thing that I harped on when I was like interrogating them, trying to get, you know, some sense of how it works is that they told me it doesn't matter. Well, you can, Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. the, The lights don't have to be off. Okay. So it doesn't have to be dark and it, you know, but if it's like, if you're looking into direct sunlight, that may impact the experience, experience. But I mean, that would impact the experience of pretty much anything if you look kind of into really bright, bright sunlight. So apparently this works in day, night. I mean, it's exciting. I mean, this video, the, the, for me, the big thing about this video is if what they're saying, if, if you read the text like I did, if what they're saying is true, and this truly represents what Magic Leap is doing, this is this is groundbreaking. This is like it's this crazy. could change everything. Like, um, I don't know if you saw the story. I think it broke last week, but uh, they were saying that Magic Leap had filed a patent. So, like, it was a patent for this visor-like helmet. Did you see that story? I know a lot about that story. Why don't you get into it? Because I saw I saw the picture of it and what it looks like, and I saw some commentary that it, like the the front visor part would be made of glass. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that particular like design. Do you think that that's what it really looks like, or okay. are we just so that's the first thing I wondered, and that's the story that a lot of uh, news outlets went with. That mm-hmm. oh look, we found the patent. This is you know at least an early prototype of what Magic Leap uh, the device will look like um it didn't look anything like what was what was described to me by magic mm-hmm. leap directly so i did what any good journalist would do i immediately reached out to magic leap and they told me no that that's comp- has nothing to do with the actual magic leap device uh that that is just an early uh so, some sort of prototype for something else mm-hmm. that they are working on um they completely shot that story out of the water and so yeah so that that's what i took away from it that, you know, that was just, yeah, that, that's just something that they were working on that they happen to have a patent for. Now, were they being honest? You know, who knows? But frankly, you know, <laughs> I kind of don't care what it looks like at this point. If what we <laughs> saw in that video is real, that, you know, for me, that's all that matters. I don't care if I have to wear a sunflower beanie, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know propeller <laughs> beanie or whatever, you know, whatever I have to wear to get that experience, I'll take it. So, yeah. So um, one thing I also want to add is, you know, if you came up with a cure for cancer, right, how much investment money do you think you'd get for that, you know, potential cure for cancer? Well, Dario, the cynic in me, my Spocky and cynic, just to bring it back from last week, says that there is no money in cure. There's only more. There's only money in the treatment. Correct answer. You win, though. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's a good answer. But just that's my way of leading up to talking about how much money has been invested in Magic Leap, which is right. a staggering one point three nine billion dollars. I'm going to say that again. One point three nine B billion dollars. Jesus. This is this is for a product that has never been touched by the consumer public. And they're Uh, super secretive. Yeah, it's not in use by any major company in terms of, you know, their operations. Um, Only a select small group of people have seen the product, you know, at work. Um, And they have, and this is, let me just, you know, just for perspective, if a company raises $20 million, that is a big deal. $20 million, okay? If a company raises $500 million, that's like, okay, this, this company is about to change everything. Get excited. $1.3 billion? <laughs> this is like, and let me, so let me also, I'm going to run down some of the investors just so you can understand that this isn't just money from some crazy, uh, you know, billionaire 
you know, on an island stroking a white cat somewhere. This is, <laughs> you know, this is from like real people or real companies that generally know what they're doing. Uh, Google mm-hmm. is one of the lead investors. JP Morgan, mm-hmm. uh, Legendary Entertainment, which is Dang. a very well known, uh, entertainment studio. Alibaba, China's Alibaba, Ooh. which is like one of their most successful tech companies. Um, Andreessen Horowitz, which is basically the g- giant, you know, venture capital company of Silicon Valley. Uh, Warner Brothers, uh, Qualcomm, Qualcomm is invest, you know, invested. Uh, there, there are a number of others. Yeah. Just, it's really just insane the amount of investment they have. And everyone, if you, you know, again, they've Magic Leap's been very secretive about what it actually is, how it works. But everyone who's actually had a chance to test it and use it, they are, they just come away with the same reaction. Stunned. This is going to just be huge. They're amazed. They also have, um, speaking of just, you know, you know, just to keep on topic with science fiction, uh, they have Neil Stevenson. They've hired Neil Stevenson to be an in-house, uh, I don't know what he does because we don't know what the product is, but yeah, he's a science fiction author, you know, the author of Snow Crash and others. I think the title I saw for Neil Stevenson was like chief futurist. Really? Which, okay. Which tells us nothing, but that tells us nothing, but it tells us that, you know, part of what they're doing requires imagination and thinking outside of the box. Um, and so, so just aside from what they're already working on with Neil Stevenson and on their own and with companies like legendary entertainment and Warner brothers, now they've hooked up with, the biggest science fiction franchise on the planet, Star Wars. And this is a big deal because it, it's not like some tiny developmental kind of like, well, we'll kind of like test out. No, they pulled out both cannons and like they put, <laughs> you know, R2-D2 and C-3PO right out there. They were like, and if you look closely on the table with the topographic map, uh-huh. there are uh, little stormtroopers running around. Did you, yeah. did you notice that? Yeah, yeah, because I think... Uh, from what I can remember of like the dialogue that 3PO and R2 are talking about, they're like, oh, oh, Master, I don't think the, the, the deal for Job of the Hut and Captain Solo went through and the stormtroopers are coming. And then, you know, a series of beep boops from R2 is what I remember. That's language, not beep boops. Don't be roboticist. Uh, is, that, is that racist for robots? I don't, I don't speak binary, okay? I'm what not would be Ray. racism for robots? What would we, not roboticist. What, what would it be? Uh, robo robo averse i don't know anyway um so this could change everything if if what we saw is the real deal because now we're in a phase in the entertainment business where hollywood i mean outside of hollywood as well but hollywood is very focused on virtual reality and virtual reality at least now requires that you put on a headset and you essentially close yourself off from the rest of the world and experience this kind of bubble uh, dream world or just kind of like another, you're basically taken into another place, you know, but you're basically closed off from the real world. Now, if what Magic Leap is doing is as revolutionary as what it appears to be, this could true. I mean, imagine, let's just, let's just take this forward for a second. Imagine you build a facility that is essentially, uh, three rooms made to look like rooms on the Death Star. Okay. Right. And you populate those three rooms. And I'm not talking about some giant, you know, theme park. I mean, literally, like, you know, let's just say a warehouse. Okay. With three giant rooms, three large rooms. And you populate those rooms with the universe of Star Wars, you know, as beamed through Magic Leap. I mean, what would, I mean, you know, that changes everything. That, you know, uh, suddenly a $15, $20 movie ticket is nothing. You, yeah. I mean, would you pay $50 to go to that warehouse and uh, interact? In a heartbeat. I'd pay like $100 in a heartbeat to do that. But what, what I think was interesting was that they, in the demo video, it was clearly in someone's house. Do you think that they would, you know, would this, would you even have to go to a, to a warehouse? Couldn't you just stay home and do that? Well, yeah, I'm I'm just thinking of like kind of best case scenario mm, where you could okay. like really, really, I mean, like 
if you're in your house and the droid comes up to your table and everything, okay, that's amazing. And we can talk about that. But I'm saying like this, these rooms in the warehouse are literally like in the real world. They build it like a set, like a real set as if you're actually on the Death Star. Oh. And it's just, and so in the real world, it's just, it's basically just an empty Death Star set that they've built. Like they would do it in Hollywood, but then you can actually visit there and use the Magic Leap technology to populate that set with characters. That would be so cool. I would pay so much money to do that. I would pay all the money, all the money. Just take my bank account. Well, we already go to like we talked about before. We we've both been to uh, Sleep No More and that's about mm-hmm. 80 bucks. Now, just take the facility of Sleep No More and populate it with, you know, Magic Leap and whatever characters, you know, Star Wars, uh, you know, the movie seven. Mm-hmm. That would be very scary. Um, you know, any number of franchises. I mean, this could really, and again, that's just talking about entertainment. You know, what about learning? You know, what if that C3PO hologram that walked up to the desk was a teacher and you're in your, you know, classroom in, you know, Tahiti, you know, and you can't really, you know, you can't afford to travel to your American university or your, you know, whatever, you know, university in Asia somewhere or whatever. And you want to have that experience there. Maybe you can have that teacher walk up to your desk and interact with you through Magic Leap. I mean, the possibilities are endless. I think we're going to wrap up, but you had another uh, immersive reality bit of news. Yes, I did. So um, Michael Bay of Transformers and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fame is partnering with a startup group, an LA-based starter, an LA-based startup called The Rogue Initiative. And what they're saying they're doing, and there was a press release that came out recently, is that they're going to collaborate to create an experience that is quote unquote immersive virtual adventures offering gritty, danger close action coupled with Michael Bay's signature style. Translation, lots and lots of explosions. And it's going to be They don't really have a lot of details on it, but they do say that they're thinking of presenting it on Sony PlayStation, Oculus Rift, uh, HTC Vive, uh, Samsung Gear VR, Amazon, and Hulu. So it looks like they're thinking of something in a immersive storytelling type film experience thing. So I guess this is so that sounds like virtual reality that they're talking about if they're talking Mm -hmm. about those headsets. So I guess this is why Magic Leap is supposedly worth $1.3 billion because – Magic Leap is promising to do all this while you're actually still engaged in the real world. Like, you know, so that, I mean, that, I mean, this is just, I, I, I'm going to have to watch this video, you know, a few more times to take this all in. Well, you know, um, one thing that you said about Magic Leap that really kind of caught my, my ear actually was how you said it was so eye focused. I, you know, like, I've heard that with, current VR sets even, you can get really car sick with it. So do you think, you know, car sickness, or at least in my experience, car sickness and the way my doctors have explained it to me, because I get car sick really easily, is that your eyes are perceive your eyes are perceiving motion, but you don't feel it when you're in the car. So is there that same type of feeling with the current VR sets to your knowledge? Or do you think my Magic Leap's focus on you know, actual eye movement could just erase all of that. Well, with VR, it seems to vary from person to person. Some people seem to get motion sickness Mm -hmm. and they, you know, they're queasy. But that seems to be kind of like a small number of people. Most people are just fascinated. I actually saw a video this week of an older woman who I I think they called her, oh, look at my grandmother using this, you know, VR headset. And apparently she passed out. Like she was on a roller coaster and she got so excited she passed out. Um, so, you know, I think some of this stuff is maybe going to be too much for some people. But with VR, I think, you know, most people, you know, they're and also they're getting better with the eye, you know, like people who wear glasses. They're, that's mm-hmm. getting better. So a lot of my friends who wear glasses, it's easier for them to use some of these headsets, particularly like uh, the um, HTC Vive. Mm-hmm. Um with the Magic Leap thing, I, I have no idea. You know, I don't know right. because I haven't used it. Um, and the descriptions have been informative. The descriptions I've gotten from the company have been informative, but generally vague. So I don't think we'll know. And that's kind of like a big, 
That's why this $1.3 billion investment is a huge gamble because you're right. Like, what if this thing comes out and they give it to the public and, you know, because they were so secretive, because it was such a small sample size of people using it, you know, there aren't enough, there, there wasn't maybe enough beta testers and feedback to let them know, uh oh, you know, turns out beaming these, you know, <laughs> beams of light onto your eyes, you know, you know, like, half of the population can't take it or whatever. Who knows? You know, I've got messed up eyes. Like I've got extreme astigmatism and that means I have to wear like specially made uh, contacts and my glasses when I do wear glasses are extremely thick. I get super car sick really easily. So just even just hearing that a small fraction of people get sick using VR, like it kind of, it kind of makes me sad that maybe I'll be one of those people who are more prone to not have a great experience. So I'm really hoping that maybe maybe like this cool eye thing, because uh, I, I don't think I've heard other VR tech so focused like on beaming it onto your eyes, you know, like maybe that I'm, I'm, I'm maybe I'm just pinning all my hope on beaming things onto my eyes will make it OK for me. I don't know. Well, so to wrap up, let me just uh, I want to give a quote from John Gaeta, who he is the executive creative director at the uh, ILM uh Lab, which is, you know, the um, Lucasfilm mm -hmm. uh, company, he when you know, with the launch of this collaboration between Magic Leap and Lucasfilm, he said, quote, we are pushing into an era of experiential, persistent and perceptual storytelling. We want people to step inside our stories and we want those stories to react back to people in deeply compelling ways. However, before magical realism becomes a seamless part of everyday life, it needs some advanced prototyping. Our collab lab is a focal point of practical problem solving, concrete groundwork, sweat and hyper innovation. And uh, just for those who don't remember, I believe John Gaeta was um, one of the chief uh, effects people behind the Matrix. How can you not be excited? Um, you know, we were promised 3D technology at the movie theaters and prices hiked up and some people enjoyed it. Some people didn't. Um you know, we've been promised in recent months and years uh, virtual reality, and some people have bought in, some people haven't. Uh, and even, you know, with some of the fascinating experiences VR delivers, there are still a lot of skeptics. But again, if you go to YouTube and uh, just look up uh, Magic Leap Star Wars on YouTube and you see this video, you may be blown away, as blown away as I was, as we were. Uh, if this is truly the future of entertainment, everything's about to change from where you see, you know, these films, uh, how you play games, how you work, uh, pretty much you know, how you compute, pretty much everything. So we'll keep our eye on that. I will continue to bug Magic Leap on my side to Please get whatever do. details I can. Yeah. And with that, we will sign off. This has been the Mars Magazine broadcast. I, actually, before we, this is something I keep forgetting to do, uh, to tell you guys where to find us. Please subscribe to us on iTunes. We are on iTunes. Uh, we're on Stitcher. Uh, we're on SoundCloud and we're also on Google's new podcast, uh, center. They have like a little, a new podcast, uh, section that they launched uh, about two months ago. So we're on those four, in those four places. You can check us out on YouTube as well. The, just the audio is on YouTube. But, uh, more than anything, please, if you use iTunes, subscribe to us on iTunes and check us out on Twitter at Mars Magazine, one word. And also the website, MarsMagazine.com, one word. Check us out there as well. Do it. That has been the Mars Magazine podcast. My name is Adario Strange with Big Song. And we will see you in the future.